Hey everyone, this of course is not my normal setup. Also, the audio might be a bit more echoey despite me running NVIDIA and having anti-echo software on. But basically, it's been like 32 degrees consistently in the UK this week. It's only going to get hotter. So I'm actually filming this downstairs. My room is on the third floor. It's just unbearably hot. Hopefully, it will cool down significantly on Thursday and Friday. So I'll be fine to film from there. But today, I am filming downstairs and I'm actually holding my mic to my mouth like I'm Big Joel or one of those other YouTubers who just hold their mic around. I don't normally do that. I have a setup for my mic. But yes, this is what we're going to have to do today. Sorry about that, but the topic is still interesting. Of course, we've got no significant backdrop or anything. No chocolate oranges today, but I think we'll just carry on as normal. A nice one off. I mean, I did film three months in Spain in my apartment. I've filmed regularly at my girlfriend's place sometimes as well. It's still very, very hot down here. Don't get me wrong. And it's about like six o'clock at the moment and I'm absolutely roasting. All the doors are closed to make the echo a tiny bit less bad. But today we are going to be talking about Sparta and the Vikings and why the far right love both of these groups. Now, I have actually made videos separately on this before, but what I wanted to get out a bit more today was the warrior aspect of it and the mythicized warrior aspect of it. And of course, obviously on the surface, this appeals to far right groups because far right ideologies are normally hyper masculine, all about conquering and all about this like hyper patriarchy and gender roles. It makes sense why Spartans and Vikings would appeal to them on the surface but of course if you are a far-right type who buys into this you have to believe in a revisionist history of both ancient sparta and the viking age because if you actually look at the real history you will know that contradicts a lot of your own ideology and what you are using this history for so today what we're going to talk about is how sparta has been elevated and mythicized by the West to be viewed as like the most elite soldier in human history and also how the structure of their society has always appealed to far right types. And then we're going to talk a bit more about Vikings and not focus as much on the history stuff as we did in the video a couple months ago, but kind of just focus on the warrior aspect. Like were Vikings these great warriors? And I think an interesting contrast between the two groups is I think on the surface, Scandinavian Vikings had a lot more visible success in battle going up against contemporaries where ancient Sparta really didn't and really lived on through these myths about the Battle of Thermopylae where various Viking groups had great success against the Anglo-Saxons, for example, in England, against the Franks in Western Europe. And they weren't just good at hit and run style tactics like you know, sailing their long ships into rivers, raiding places and quickly leaving or getting paid off by European monarchs. In England specifically, they proved they could also be a pretty formidable fighting force across land without relying on these long ships. So all of that coming up for you today in the video. But before we go any further, please consider liking the video and in the comments, do you know anyone who subscribes to this like cringe Spartan ideology? I mean, like either workout programs or people who are really into like US military stuff who have all these like Spartan logos and Spartan iconography on their like military gear. Let me know in the comments. Also similar to that, anything to do with Vikings too, let me know down in the comments as well. Also consider becoming a patron. I try to build up as many one to three dollar patrons as possible and the benefits of that again access to my Nintendo Switch friend code and the private patrons discord server. Also follow me on social media at McCavanacle on Twitter on Instagram. Also check out my subreddit in the description and subscribe to the Cavernacle Extra, my second channel where I archive my live streams that I usually do two times a week. Haven't done one this week because it's too hot. Might not stream this week, but usually it is two times a week. So I wanted to start this video by just reading you some Unreal Cope because whenever I make these history videos contradicting these narratives believed by conservatives or far-right types, they often get very, very offended. You guys remember in my video last week about Anglo-Saxons, People were criticizing me saying like, you know, you Marxists, you hate the indigenous people of Great Britain because the Anglo-Saxons are of course the indigenous people of Britain. So I wanted to read some comments I've received before. So the left don't like seeing anything that don't have white people kneeling or submitting to their political doctrine. How as a man are you such a wimp? 
I mean, I know why you're doing this. Such a sorry excuse for a man you are. Dude, stop using studies by the ideological enemy of European people and rabid lesbian man-haters. Haha, <laughs> Marxist propaganda. Are you Jewish? Surprisingly get stuff like this all the time. Lovely people who infect my comment section. Wouldn't you like to be me and read thousands of these every month? But first I wanna start with the Spartans and I wanna talk about why these guys have been mythicized, why people love them, why people think they are the height of, I guess, you know, Western civilization. So to start with, I guess we have to talk about the film 300. Now the film 300, which is pretty overtly fascist, including the graphic novel as well. People have often made excuses for this and said, well, it's about a soldier telling other Spartans about this war. Of course it's propaganda. If the theme of the film is how war often makes societies fascist or something. I think it failed quite poorly because what you essentially get is something that was made at the height of the war on terror where you have visibly white European versions of Spartans who probably wouldn't look much like this fighting an extremely racist version of the Persian Empire where you have Xerxes played by a Brazilian man covered in like this makeup and all these piercings and it makes Persia look like the height of degeneracy in ancient culture where the Spartans are oh so civilized and must protect the whole of Greece, the whole of the West from these awful Persians, not mentioning of course the Spartans actually collaborated with the Persians later and not mentioning that Persia was a relatively more progressive society and actually contributed more to world history than the Spartans ever did. But of course, let Frank Miller and Zack Snyder tell you different, but this is of course renewed interest in the Spartans. Now, there was a 1960s movie that had a very similar premise, but the Battle of Thermopylae has been in popular imagination for, you know, literally since it happened. Now, many of you might not know too much about the Spartans because besides 300, there isn't really much pop culture about it. I would say one of the better versions of them is in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which is a game I really like, and you are actually the grandson of Leonidas in this game. And you get to see all of Greek society. You get to see Sparta, you get to see Athens during their war against each other, and you see how different they were. But people often say, well, how can, how can you cite Assassin's Creed? It's not accurate. Assassin's Creed is not accurate. It does take a lot of historical liberties. It also does have a good discovery mode where it actually focuses more on the actual history and actually talked about why it often ignored certain parts of history or changed them in the pursuit of making a better game. But maybe if you didn't play that mode, you don't know how Spartan society was structured. So I just wanna share an article quick that talks about Spartan society. So Sparta was a warrior society in ancient Greece that reached the height of its power after defeating the rival city-state Athens in the Peloponnesian War 431 to 404 BC. Spartan culture was centered on loyalty to the state and military service. At age seven, Spartan boys entered a rigorous state-sponsored education, military training and socialization program known as the Agoge. The system emphasized duty, discipline and endurance. Although Spartan women were not active in the military, they were educated and enjoyed more status and freedom than other Greek women. Because Spartan men were professional soldiers, all manual labor was done by a slave class, the Helots. Despite their military prowess, the Spartan dominance was short-lived. In 371 BC, they were defeated by Thebes at the Battle of Leuctra, and the empire went into a period of long decline. The population of Sparta consisted of three main groups, the Spartans, who were full citizens, the Helots, who were serfs and slaves, and the Barochi, who were neither slaves nor citizens, whose names mean dwelling around. They worked as craftsmen and traders and built weapons for the Spartans. All healthy male Spartan citizens participated in the compulsory state-sponsored education system, which emphasized obedience, endurance, courage, and self-control. Spartans' way of life would not have been possible without the helots, who handled all the day-to-day -day tasks and unskilled labor required to keep society functioning. They were farmers, domestic servants, nurses, and military attendants. The Spartans, who were outnumbered by the Helots, often treated them brutally and oppressively in an effort to prevent uprisings. Sparta was centered on a warrior culture. Male Spartan citizens were allowed only one occupation. Soldier indoctrination into their lifestyle began early. Spartan boys started their military training at seven. The boys lived under austere conditions and they were subjected to continual 
physical competitions given meager rations and expected to become skilled at stealing food among other survival skills. So on the surface, you can already see why that would appeal to far right types as it did appeal to the Germans in the 1930s. You have a Spartan Greek elite. All men are soldiers from about age seven to age 60. And while women had some better rights than the rest of Greece, they still had their roles in this patriarchal system. And the whole thing was made possible by a lower class of person, the helots, who would take care of all the, I guess, labor that no one wanted to do. And that sounds a lot like what the Germans wanted to do with the Slavic populations and what they often did do with the Slavic populations in Eastern Europe to do all the hard tasks in society. And the Germans often did and wanted to work them to death to basically hold up this German society where the German elite didn't have to do these things and they could focus on other things like war or cultural things. But of course, although Germans in the 30s and 40s liked Spartan society, Spartans aren't most famous for the way they structured their society. They're most famous for fighting wars. But how true is it that they were actually this amazing fighting force that the whole world should remember. Like, was there anything really special about them besides every Spartan man having to essentially give his life to military service? So by Joshua Browers, the Spartans at war, myth versus reality. No source from the period says anything about the Spartans being particularly warlike, having unique military institutions or abilities, or being a daunting opponent in war. We even have some tentative evidence to suggest the opposite. Some native Spartan writers survived from this period and they confirm the sense that Sparta was not really special among Greek states. The war songs of Piteos speak of bitter conflict to neighboring Messenians, but they don't mention any of the military institutions, practices, or ranks known from later times. The choral songs of Orkman, meanwhile, are full of happy verses about pretty girls, flowers, and bees. At the so-called Battle of the Champions around 550 BC, a picked force of 300 Spartans fought a group of 300 Argives for control over a patch of borderland, the end result, according to Herodotus, was that two of the Argives and only one Spartan were left alive. While this may be little more than a legendary tale, it does not suggest the Spartans were in any sense superior in combat. Apparently, the Argives could give as good as they got in a mass duel where they had nothing to rely on but their own skill and strength. But then came the Battle of Thermopylae. Our main source of this battle is Herodotus and he was born only a few years before it took place and lived his adult life in a time when the story of Leonidas' last stand was widely known. This is unfortunate because that means the legend it spawned already contaminates our earlier source, and Herodotus is already not a reliable source on history despite being known as like the first Western historian, but he already gushes about how the Spartans are indifferent to death, will never retreat or surrender, and are basically the best warriors in the world. However, Herodotus is unable to show in his description of the battle that this was actually the case. Apart from some peculiar feign retreats, the Spartans seem to fight just like everybody else, taking their turns to guard a strong point that countless armies throughout history have successfully blocked, even against overwhelming enemy numbers. Their advantage was the terrain, and any Greek force could have done just as well as the Spartans in Hole in the Pass. But the Spartan decision to stand their ground, even after the pass had been turned, made them into legends. A great deal can be said about Thermopylae and the senseless sacrifice of Leonidas and his men. The main thing to note here is that the Spartans seem to have taken complete control of the way the battle was remembered. Even though Phoebians and Thespians also stayed and fought to the last man, the story was all about how the Spartans had done so. Even though the Persians triumphed and the Greek defeat brought untold suffering upon the Phocians and Athenians, the story was always that the Spartans' defiance made the battle a moral victory. They had sacrificed themselves for Greece. They had lived up to their harsh laws and died where they stood. At Thermopylae, Sparta made its name as a society of warriors. Afterwards, everyone feared them. We are frequently told of their shaking knees and chattering teeth of those who know they're going up against the Spartans. However, from sources from the classical period, it becomes clear that Spartan is feared and respected in warfare only because of Thermopylae. No one can name any other example of Spartans fighting to the death against insurmountable odds. When the Spartans surrendered at the Battle of Vectaria, comparisons were immediately drawn with the men of Leonidas, whose reputations warriors had failed to live up to. There were apparently no other go-to example of Spartan prowess. So as we saw from that article, the whole notion that Sparta was an amazing military power 
was all down to the Battle of Thermopylae and the propaganda around the Battle of Thermopylae. And that's all Sparta was really known for, for contributing to Western civilization is stopping those barbaric Persians from conquering all of ancient Greece. But then the Spartans didn't mind allying themselves with the Persians a bit later. But if you delve into any real history of the Spartans in the time period, you will see while their society was interesting, the way they structured it was interesting, the history is interesting. There isn't really anything that notable about them as these absolutely invincible warriors, apart from a battle they lost in a war they lost that in the end didn't really matter so much to them because like I said, they allied themselves with the Persians later. Now, of course, there are so many different societies that look back at ancient Greece and try and copy it or think it's like the height of human civilization. So it's probably not surprising that the Germans in the 1930s and 40s were also obsessed with Sparta, like they were obsessed with the Romans, like they were obsessed with the Vikings. And this is for multiple reasons, which is also aped by Golden Dawn in 2015, also loving the Spartans for the Battle of Thermopylae as well. So extracts from Oren Hubert, the Germans continued a concept found in Prussian militaristic ideology in which Sparta became the ideal model for the training of youth and national achievement. Helen Roche opens her article by stating that Goebbels visited Sparta in 1936 and he said he felt he was in a true German city. Alongside Goebbels was the Minister of Agriculture, Richard Walter Dare, who also idolized Sparta to a point where he stated that a number of times, as well as published a few articles that put Sparta as the German ideal of blood and soil. In January 1942, Hitler is recorded to have said in his monologue, if anyone asks us about our forefathers, we must continually imply they were Greeks. He started his use of Sparta as his ideal as far back as 1928 in his secret book and continued to imply the importance of Sparta as the German ancestor, thereby giving the German propaganda machine full legitimacy to use and abuse Sparta throughout the course of the war. It was inevitable that the Germans would take up the Spartan legend as their own ideology since it was already being ingrained into their subconscious ever since the early 19th century and were adopted and amplified by the German war machine to instill further and blind obedience in its military arm, as well as act as a new world religion, the religion of Nordic and Aryan master race based on purity, nature, and beauty. This further and blind obedience enabled them to continue their losing battle to the final days of the war. And just to bring this to a more modern context, Golden Dawn exploits darker side of Greece's discontent. Standing before them, a member of the European Parliament from Golden Dawn roused the crowd with, with defiant denunciations of enemies at home and abroad. The message of Leonidas, come and get it, is as timely today as ever for everything tormenting Greece, the retired lieutenant general, told supporters waving flags, bearing the party's emblem. We're not like everyone else with our heads bowed down. We're upright, we're standing, and the message will be delivered on September 20th. We must not surrender, we must not back down. People, army, nationalism. Before we end the Spartan segment, a really good article a couple years ago by Mike Cole. The Spartan fetish is a cultural cancer and it caused a big backlash at the time. And he says, the Spartan legend trades on our deep seated sense of inadequacy. It mines our insecurities that we aren't strong enough, hard enough, disciplined enough. If we want our sports teams to bring home the trophy, if we want to win a fight, if we want the grit and sheer toughness to triumph in life, we would do well to emulate the Spartans. At the heart of the Spartan legend is the Battle of Thermopylae, told and retold in countless books, essays, and films, including in 1962 with Rudolf Marte's The 300 Spartans. One boy who watched the movie Frank Miller became a comic book artist, and he was inspired by the Thermopylae legend to update it in 1998 in 300. It became a smash hit and, of course, made into a film in 2006. Controversial movie offended Iranians with its Orientalist portrayal of the bare Persian ancestors, while Western critics lambasted its iconography. Both the comic and film portray the myth with clear anti-immigrant glee. 300 makes no effort to beg off its message. Now, I just talked a bit about the influence on America itself. American founding father Sam Adams lamented that his native Boston would never be the Christian Sparta he had hoped for. Fellow founding father John Dickinson considered the Spartans to be as brave and free a people as ever existed. Adams's contemporary, the legendary Jean-Jacques Rousseau, practically drooled over Sparta's myth, praising 
that city as famous for its happy ignorance as for the wisdom of its laws, whose virtue seems so much greater than those of men, that it was a republic of demigods rather than of men. This just skims the surface, miles wide and fathoms deep, of the legions of historical thinkers and writers in love with the Spartan mirage, distant and wavering. So I like the language he uses in there, and going back to like the far-right appropriation of Sparta, of course, you understand how their revisionist history makes this make sense, that this whole society based on the military was the way to go based on the Battle of Thermopylae and the myths around it, because that's what can save you from invasion. That's what can save Western civilization. This is what you need to survive in like this brutal world and defend your culture. But like the article was kind of saying, it's just had a massive cultural influence on everyone, the founding fathers of America people during that period in other places, people in World War II, all were talking about like how free and great Sparta was, despite the fact it could only exist based on enslaving thousands of other Greeks. Sports teams, military stuff, even Master Chief in Halo, they're all named after Spartans or had the iconography of Spartans. There is a Western fetishization of Sparta, which is completely against the actual history of Sparta. These people weren't the best warriors of all time. They weren't even that notable in their own time. It's just all propaganda that you think they were especially good soldiers. And that is pretty much it. And a lot of it is far right propaganda at that. I always find it really cringy and laughable. There's so many things about Sparta and Spartans and like fitness communities and stuff like that. But kind of like going from that to Vikings is quite interesting because I would say, Vikings both had a reputation for being fierce warriors, but they actually had evidence of being fierce warriors. Like they didn't just fight one battle that they lost. They actually conquered a lot of places and were hated by Europeans for being a constant annoyance to their kingdoms because of their tactics. So the Germans liked the Vikings for two reasons, mainly because of racism. So I just wanna talk about this first and then move on to the warrior stuff a bit more. So I read this article in my video about Vikings, but I just wanna read a tiny bit of it. So rather than a celebration of Nordic heritage, German Nordicism aligns itself more solidly with the fetishization of those of Nordic descent. In this way, the fictional Nordic race was considered to be the most superior branch of the Aryan race. In the late 19th and early 20th century, a growing number of anti-modern Germanic religious groups rooted in ancient Germanic and pagan mythology began to explicitly link Nordic, Aryan, and Germanic groups into a blended form of nationalism and spirituality. Nordicism was seen to be an organic extension of the growing vision of Aryan superiority in New Germany. So basically, the Germans tried to appeal to Scandinavian countries based on this, you know, shared heritage, because obviously throughout medieval times and even earlier, a lot of these groups conquered different lands and shared different lands or were genetically quite similar. So obviously the Germans like talking about Anglo-Saxons to say they had a shared common like ancestry with the people of Britain and other groups in Northern Europe and Denmark, often using their propaganda like long ships and Viking iconography to try and get like Norwegians and Swedes and other groups on side with them. But it was pretty much fascinated with the supposed purity of blood these groups had. Not as much to do with the actual warrior culture or the stuff to do with Odin and Valhalla. Although that was there, that sort of stuff has become far more prominent in modern times since about like the 1970s and it became a massive thing in US prison culture with extremist Odinism, which is linked to a lot of far right groups today. And basically it takes like the pure blood part that you know the Germans in the 1930s believed about Scandinavians and themselves, and then mixes it more with a militancy that they believed the Vikings had back in the day. But like I've already said, I think the Vikings historically are better warriors than the Spartans. So you can see how that appeals to people because the Vikings successfully conquered a lot of England. They didn't just raid England and sail away with you know, boatloads of treasure, they actually came to stay. They settled, of course, one of their most notable settlements was taking over York, calling it Jorvik. And like I said, if you play Assassin's Creed Valhalla, very, very interesting when you go into the Discovery Tour mode, they show you so much history of how the cultures mix, the Saxon Christians 
and the Scandinavian Vikings mixed together and created this like new form of culture. But of course, there were like Rus Vikings who constantly harassed the Byzantines, but were often employed by the Byzantines as mercenaries, as they were also employed by various Arab caliphates. Scandinavian Vikings also often went to the Mediterranean to raid or work as mercenaries. Some converted to Islam while they were there, and of course, the multiculturalism of the Vikings and how much they settled all around the Mediterranean and even in the Middle East puts a big dent into the theory that these people often talk about, like the blood purity. Like, do you think these people never went back to Scandinavia? It's like when I was reading about British genetics and how people who love and fetishize Anglo-Saxon identity talk about how it's kind of like pure. But then if you look at actual genetics, you find Middle Eastern and African from ancient times in British DNA. Because of course, with the Roman Empire and Britain becoming a part of the Roman Empire, people from the African and Middle Eastern part of the empire actually went to Britain as well. The same way that Vikings would assimilate to cultures overseas or bring back elements of it with them back home. Now the Viking success in military conquests and military battles also plays in with the religious aspects. Because of course, Viking religion and Norse mythology is very complicated. It's not all about being a warrior and dying in battle gloriously for Odin because there are parts of the afterlife where just your average farmer will go and live a happy existence. But there is, of course, the great hall in Valhalla for the warriors to drink and feast every day, then kill each other every day, getting ready for the end times to fight with Odin. So modern day far right ideologies take that part of the religion, take the parts of the history they like and have made it into this militant far right ideology where essentially being a Norse pagan is solely about fighting killing and getting to Valhalla with your brothers really plays into the sort of stuff you see in shows like Vikings. I just wanted to talk about, just like with the Spartan stuff, how this isn't really rooted in history at all. Um, the weak, why the right are co-opting Norse symbolism. In pre-Christian Norse belief, Valhalla is the hall where those who die heroically are taken to prepare for Ragnarok, the battle at the world's end, under the watchful eye of the god Odin. Dying heroically, according to most Norse sources, means having fought bravely in battle. So the far right find what they want to find in Norse myth, violence, ruthlessness, and an existential war that will lead to the rebirth of a new world, and they read no deeper. So a Washington Post article about a similar thing, even the Vikings did not exist in pure white racial isolation. The Vikings, or rather the conglomeration of Scandinavian peoples we've come to call Vikings, conquered and colonized where they found weak powers in the disorganized west of Europe. To the east, they also tapped into the rich multicultural trading networks, fighting when useful, but delighted to engage in economics and cultural exchanges with great powers of Eurasia. This included the Khazar Jews. I've actually just read about this in my medieval history book. Christians dedicated to both Rome and Constantinople and Muslims of every sect and ethnicity. Islamic coins, in fact, have been found buried across the Viking world, a testimony to the richness of this exchange. The fact that the whole notion of a pure white medieval Europe so important to the far right today is false. The fixation on skin color is largely a modern phenomenon, alien to a Europe dependent on the Mediterranean world, composed of people with varying shades of brown skin. It's not that the medievals lack prejudice or hate, but our hang up and divisions were not theirs. Medieval Europe was not isolated from the broader world, but rather participated in a global Middle Ages that linked great Eurasian and African cultures through the movements of things and people. But just before we move on, I want to talk about how this cherry picking of history has really led to a form of militant Odinism. Now, Odinism and various forms of pagan Norse religion aren't inherently violent, but in America, there's been a particular brand of it that has thrived in the prison system that has really entered into mainstream far-right beliefs. So Odinists worship ancient Norse gods such as Thor and Odin. They typically wear pendants of Thor's hammer around their necks and meet for rituals in the woods where they drink mead from a communal horn, read ancient poetry, and occasionally sacrifice to the gods. For many far-right types, Odinism's motifs of revenge and action resonate far more than the values of Christianity, which was once their religion. They believe they are fighting a battle, preserve their culture, 
and love thy neighbor just seems weak next to a religion that rewards warriors for fighting and dying for their noble cause. Odinism was spread in the US throughout the 70s and 80s by devotees, including Elsie Christiansen, a Danish immigrant who traveled America setting up Odinist groups in prison. She preached that America will never become strong again until it regains its national and racial pride, and that the only cure for America's spiritual sickness is Odinism, just as the vast majority of the world's 1.6 billion Muslims or 2.2 billion Christians reject hate, only a tiny sliver of adherence to heathen religions such as Odinism's have a hateful worldview. And a quote from one of these guys involved in an Odinist group, we have to be prepared to fight. We need to study martial arts, weight train. We need to be prepared and unified and ready to defend ourselves and continue to tell society the truth and help most souls find their way out of hell and back to Midgard. That way they'll unite and understand the threat we face. It will always be honorable to die in battle. So to subscribe to this form of Odinism, you have to ignore a lot of the history we have spoke about. You have to ignore the often symbiotic relationships between different ethnic groups in the early medieval period, especially because in the book I'm reading at the moment, the 600s to about the 900s are way more a time of commerce economies linking together, trading outposts, especially from Scandinavians going as far as the Middle East and the Byzantine Empire, like I said in that, trading with the Khazar Jews as well. This is something that seems far more common before the dividing lines between the supposed Christian West and the Islamic East became far more of a factor, especially during the crusading period. Because when I read about this time period, it reminds me a lot more of antiquity than I kind of imagine medieval times would be. But to a lot of people, medieval times are the dark ages, intolerance. Every group stays together. It doesn't mix with anyone else. It has no contact with the rest of the world. And everything is characterized by just this religious battle. And no one is tolerant of anything. But in reality, especially the Vikings, who were very accomplished sailors, would travel all around the Mediterranean and visit all different groups and work for different groups and trade with different groups. And as they traveled around the Middle East Mediterranean, you can imagine they probably took wives who weren't actually white. So these Odinists who believe that they're saving the supposed white race through these honorable battles that will take them to our Halle, obviously ignore actual Norse history and the people who invented the pagan religion in the first place. So to conclude, what I find interesting about both these groups and their links to like far-right ideologies or like more conservative ideologies is that they both have to rely on wildly inaccurate histories to make kind of like a similar point about warrior culture. So with the Spartans, it's obviously true their whole society was oriented around war, especially for Spartan men. That's literally all they did. But there is a huge myth that they were the best fighters around or even noteworthy, as we read in that history. They didn't even seem noteworthy at the time. The whole image of Sparta and Spartans is just because of the Battle of Thermopylae, which was originally lionized by Herodotus, who wasn't a very reliable historian, and because he's one of the most notable early historians, people took his word and ran with it, and that eventually entered popular history and also just culture around the world. And because Europeans increasingly looked back to ancient Greece and Rome in like the 1700s and 1800s, Sparta became more popular again. And then you have far-right groups in the 1930s looking at the Spartan society and being like, that looks pretty good. I want that for my country. And then in the post-war period, the myth of the Spartan gains more prominence through the 1962 movie. And of course, the 2006 Zack Snyder movie, which introduced this legend to a whole group of people who started to just absolutely love the Spartans and buying to this myth that they were significantly good warriors when they weren't that notable. But they did live in an authoritarian monarchy built on slave labor and conquest. Now going to the Vikings is broad term we use for like various different groups of Scandinavians in the medieval period. It's actually true they were quite notable fighters, effective tactics when it came to sailing and raiding and proved themselves in the field of battle against various different Christian groups. That part of it is pretty indisputable, 
but often their reputation is kind of morphed into something that is on par with Sparta. Like everyone in Viking society was just bred to be a conquering like soldier, when in reality, obviously most Vikings and even a lot of Viking men just existed as farmers. Obviously, a lot of them had the dual role of raider in the summer and spring and farmer in the autumn and winter, but it wasn't a society all built around warfare. They had to raid because they didn't have as much farmland often or as viable farmland as a lot of other European territories. But what obviously the Germans did in the 1930s was say that well, the Vikings just stayed in Scandinavia and England and Northern Europe and they didn't mix with anyone. And today the far right basically take that as well and say, well, also the Vikings just love war and love going to Valhalla. That's all there was to them and that is all we'll take from them and we'll create this mythicized view of Norse history and Norse mythology and we'll make it seem like that is the truth. And that is essentially the far right in a nutshell. Take history, cherry pick it or completely distort it and make it your ideology. And that is something we see with the Anglo-Saxons, and it's something we see with the Vikings and the Spartans. So let me know what you guys think down in the comments. This was a hard one to get through. I'm really, really hot right now, but I'm glad I still made a video today. And let me know if there's any other like historical topics you'd like me to tackle. Of course, subscribe if you're new, like the video. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.